markets. The committee, he repeats, is proceeding carefully right now, watching the data to make decisions. But he does adopt some of the arguments that those who on the committee have suggested a pause in November have made recently, saying that long-term bond yields are a significant factor in significantly tightening financial conditions. And those financial conditions are helping to slow the economy. They will keep an eye on whether the real rates continue to slow growth before they make a decision. He does note that growth has been stronger and the committee is aware of the fact that it has been stronger than anybody had expected. And he said that is historically unusual. But many indicators, according to the chairman, suggest the labor market is beginning to gradually cool. Wage growth is gradually declining to sustainable levels. And uh, he does suggest that there are some factors out there that would cause the Fed to uh, look again at policy, including geopolitical tensions. Mm -hmm. And he does suggest that inflation is still too high. It is coming down, and the September inflation data, uh, data was somewhat less encouraging. And so the committee is going to be paying attention to that as well. And he sums it all up by saying that growth has been stronger than anticipated. And if that is the case, uh, persistent growth could put upward pressure on inflation and warrant further tightening of monetary policy. Guys? Yeah, Guy, it was interesting. You look at the bond market, you're seeing buying now come in, particularly on the two-year. You got yields down three basis points, yeah. and the long end yields are also down one. This is the problem, right? You come out and you say rates are doing are the job for us, and then actually you get lower rates. <laughs> yeah, and this is this is the, the kind of interesting dynamic. If the Fed is prepared to sub out the kind of the management of this process to the market, so you guys do the work for us, we're, we're okay, we'll sit and watch. That can turn on you and bite you fairly quickly. And I, I just kind of wonder whether or not actually the Fed is going to want to reassert itself in this narrative, its control of the process. Because it's been interesting listening to people, Fed, Fed speakers over the last few days, time and time again. Like I, think, I think what Powell is saying is a little more muted, actually. I think Powell is sounding maybe a little less dovish than maybe some of those other speakers have been. Lawrence, what do you think? Well, look, we knew there was going to be no move at this meeting. We didn't need to see higher long-term rates to tell us that. That is the most important development since the last meeting. And it does lead people to say, well, might this substitute for one more cut? Very important. But he's emphasized this tension I talked about between stronger growth and continued moderation in inflation. Uh, now, he thinks we're going to need below-trend growth to get there. I don't think so. OK? But that's what he thinks we're not getting. The, the macro projections of the, of the committee suggest we're not going to get below trend growth, but we're going to get inflation down to 2% in any case. So how much more work then do you think that the Fed actually does have to do? And do they have to sort of keep it hawkish in order to prevent the market from front running? Well, yes, they want to talk this way, what we call hawkish pauses, OK? It's a diminishing uh, uh, credibility as you hold again and again and again. But the basic story is we're close. Uh, and the fact that rates have risen has made the committee more sensitive and more likely not to raise rates in the near term. There's no question about that. Uh, but they're, they're still dealing with this tension and yep. sort of alternative scenarios associated with it. Uh, but I think they're making good progress. I think things are going as well as can be expected, given the surge of inflation. Do you think interest rates are going to have to stay more elevated than they have done over the last few years, over the next few years? And do you think the neutral rate is higher now? So I think the way the committee thinks about it is the further tightening is going to be from the duration of where you end up rather than further rate hikes. That's where the discussion is moving, higher for longer. And uh, I think that's the case. I, I might note that as inflation comes down, real rates will continue to rise. So monetary policy effectively will be getting tighter and tighter. And the question is, is that OK? Is that right. consistent with what the economy needs? That's one of the key questions going forward. That, that's a, yeah, is that OK? That's like a really great question, Larry. Um, we, uh, Powell was talking a little bit about, about, about geopolitics. We heard in his remarks, and we'll hear from him in just a moment. Um, when you're at the Fed, like, wh how do you think about geopolitical events that the Fed has absolutely no control over, but that will absolutely affect the economy? Or could, I, I should say, affect the economy? 
Well, um, look, geopolitical events, to the extent they affect the U.S. economy, chaos in the financial markets, et cetera, tremendous flights to safety, all of those can affect the drivers of monetary policy. Uh, but the Fed can't do anything about it. Now, it's reasonable for him to mention it because everybody's going to want to know that question. At this point, the answer is no impact today. We'll see going forward. In terms of what is happening on the fiscal deficit front, clearly we are now going to be seeing significant government issuance going forward. What effect is that having into the calculation that the Fed has to make, Lawrence? How do they think about the external factors that are going to influence where yields are ultimately going to be? They can influence the front end. There's a range of factors as you go further down the curve that start to manifest. So that's very true. Uh, I have always said that the deficits and the increase in the, in the debt to income ratio is going to be a, a force leaving real rates higher than otherwise. Uh, I think the, uh, the neutral funds rate has increased about a half a percentage point, and that may be part of the story of long term rates. But it's really the term premium. Mm -hmm. Why has the term premium increased as much as it, as it has? Now, the story about government issuance is a story about duration in the market, which mm -hmm. puts upward pressure on rates. So that, that's certainly part of it. The higher for longer is the market continues to say, well, I don't know, but that's emphasized. That's part of it as well. We're all waiting, Larry, for sort of things to break, right? Because that's going to be the signal to the Fed to take their foot off the gas. We had the banking issue, which was a liquidity mismatch uh, earlier, but not like a credit issue yet. When you look not at the data that we're seeing, like what is that on, how does that unfold? And, and when do you expect that to happen? How long is that lag? Well, the credit event uh, has basically passed. Uh, really? There has been much less impact on the economy that was expected when that occurred. There was an overreaction of monetary policymakers for what that would mean for rates. So the story now is not, credit is, is is becoming more restrained, but just in the way it typically does when the Fed is tightening. So the focus is not on credit concerns. Uh, uh, of course, borrowing costs have increased, as one would expect. Uh, uh, yeah. But it's on longer-term rates and appropriate monetary policy. Lawrence, the, the market is now pricing out additional interest rate increases from the Fed. Do you think that is the message that Fed Chair Jay Powell wants to deliver here? Well, he doesn't want to rock the boat. Uh, uh, he doesn't want to move markets. We're right before a meeting, and the markets are priced very nicely in terms of the Fed. They know there's no move uh, today. They think it's less likely than not that they won't move again. Perfectly uh, reasonable. And uh, that's the message that uh, the chairman wants to give. There are risks, given the stronger growth. Uh, given the fact that that might interfere with the further moderation of inflation, that's what would need, uh, lead the Fed to raise rates more. Um, and it's very data yeah. determined. Nobody knows what's going to happen in December and January. That depends on the incoming data. They have to be pushed to raise rates further. Um, yes. Also, I should point out, we are still waiting for Fed Chair Jay Powell to give this speech. It's running a bit late. There's a reason, uh, Mike McKee. Uh, Mike, what, 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 what's happening? Why is the room dark? We were expecting the speech about four minutes ago. What's going on? Uh, this has happened before with public figures. Apparently, a group of climate activists have interrupted the meeting, and they've escorted Jay Powell off stage, and I presume David Weston as well, uh, to keep them safe for the time being while they calm things down. So um, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with monetary policy, and certainly climate change doesn't have a lot to do with uh, the Fed's uh, activities, but uh, they are using this platform to try and make a point. So we are now waiting. We're in in on yep. hold to uh, see when they get the room cleared and then uh, can bring the chairman back. Mike, let's just, let's just talk about what's happening because we're, we're all waiting for the speech now, so we're trying to figure out that we're trying to interpret the market reaction to what we've heard, the comments that you brought us a little bit earlier on. The sense seems to be that the comments that are being delivered are not pushing back on current market pricing. The market, therefore, is taking this as actively dovish, maybe in line with some of the other Fed speak that we've seen recently. 
is that your interpretation? We're seeing rate hikes being priced a little more softly. Uh, we're seeing the yields coming down a little bit, particularly at the front end. Do you think, having read the comments, that this is the message that, that Jay Powell is hoping to deliver in this conversation? I think so. I think what he was trying to do was basically come in line with what we've heard from at least 12 other members of the committee since their last meeting, suggesting that the real rates are doing enough of the job and at this point they can pause. And you see that uh, result in the Fed funds futures. There wasn't much of a percentage chance of a rate increase given by the markets for November 1st, and now it's down to 5%. So uh, it looks like investors are understanding this as essentially a dovish uh, speech. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if dove and hawk applies in this case uh, because the Fed is pretty much almost done anyway, but it does suggest not to expect anything on November 1st from the Fed. But I wonder if it also talks about the, the cuts. Um, it feels like a lot of the movement, um, Mike, has been pricing out cuts for uh, next year and that that's where you're maybe going to see that whole pancake curve. Uh, and I wonder if how, how Powell addresses that while staying on his message. I think that might be uh, something that David will ask him because the, there is a question about what is going to happen going forward and Powell alludes to it in his prepared remarks talking about how the economy has been much stronger than people anticipated and the September inflation numbers have been disappointing and if the economy continues to grow at the rate it is it suggests that inflation will be sticky if not go up again and the Fed might have to do more. So that raises a question of what happens in 2024 but I think if you hold his feet to the fire, Powell will say, I, I can't make a prediction because I don't know whether the economy is going to continue along this path. Very strong third quarter numbers, but you still yep. have a lot of economists, including Bloomberg Economics, suggesting recession in the fourth quarter or the, the first quarter of next year. Let's just recap and figure out exactly where we are as we, as we work our way to the, this conversation commencing. The headlines that, that dropped um, at noon. The FOMC is proceeding quote carefully given the risks and the hikes that have been delivered thus far. Many indicators suggest that the labour market is gradually cooling. Additional evidence, quote, of a strong economy may merit hiking, but I, I emphasise the additional evidence. Financial condition moves can affect policy if, quote, persistent. Geopolitical tensions, uh, Jay Powell is going to say, highly elevated and pose key risks. So what we've seen in reaction to this, let me just walk you through the market reaction, is less of a reaction in tens, but, a, but an immediate reaction and a shift lower in twos. So twos drop, 5.1735 is where we are now. We were north of 2.2, uh, 5.22, coming into those comments being delivered. So we are seeing um, yields coming a little lower, particularly at the front end. In terms of what we're seeing at tens and at thirties, less of a reaction action there uh, and we do still see the 10s and 30s Alex um, on mm -hmm. offer at the moment but the front end getting bid as we see these comments coming through as the market largely prices out the idea which I think it was already at mm -hmm. that November is a, is a no-go but I think just just maybe just emphasizing from Powell the dovish, dovish narrative that we've seen from so many other Fed speakers over the last few days. And I should point out that as you mentioned the front end is seeing the move equity is not really doing a lot um, which is leads to that volatility that we've seen within the bond market, which makes it difficult uh, when you're looking across assets and then where that safe haven uh, trade may be. Lawrence, a lot of the um, upward momentum in equities has been the soft landing scenario. Based on your modeling and what you see of the data, is soft landing still in the cards or do you think at some point it's going to get dicey? Well, it's very unusual, but I would say more likely than not. And soft, you know, softish. Uh, they're expecting macroeconomic heaven, which is the best possible outcome. Uh, uh, but uh, yes, uh, we think no recession, though the yield curve is signaling a very high probability of recession. Uh, but uh, I would say uh, overall, uh, looking at what we're seeing in terms of the momentum and growth, uh, very little chance of recession over the next year. Do you think, Lawrence, that a recession is required to get inflation ultimately down to 2 percent? Absolutely not. Uh, I may be in, in, in a minority. I don't think we need to see increased slack. I don't think we need to see below trend growth. And in fact, the staff forecast suggests they don't think we need it either. 
Uh, it looks like we could be getting close. Lights are back on. Fed Chair Jay Powell has just sat down. I see David also semi in the dark. So we're almost there. Um, Hey, Mike, I just want to check back in with you here. Uh, again, we read through the statement. We're going to wait for Jay Powell, which looks like he's actually taking the podium. So let's go there right now. Uh, hey, Lawrence, thank you very much. Lawrence Meyer, former Fed governor and monetary policy analytics uh, chairman. And let's go now to the Economic Club of New York to Jay Powell. Before COVID. So before our discussion, uh, I'll take a few minutes to, to discuss recent economic data and the outlook for monetary policy. Um, <clears throat> incoming data over recent months show ongoing progress toward both of our dual mandate goals, maximum employment, and stable prices. And I'll start with inflation. By the time we raised uh, rates in March of 2022, it was clear that restoring price stability would require both the unwinding of pandemic-related distortions to supply and demand, and also restrictive monetary policy to cool strong demand and give supply time to catch up. These forces are now working together to bring inflation down. After peaking at 7.1% in June 2022, 12-month headline PCE inflation is estimated at 3.5% through September. Core PCE inflation, which omits the volatile food and energy components, provides a better indicator of where inflation is heading. And 12-month core PCE inflation peaked at 5.6% in February 2022 and is estimated at 3.7% through September. So clear progress there. <clears throat> Inflation readings turned lower over the summer, uh, a very favorable development. The September inflation data continued that downward trend, but were somewhat less encouraging. And shorter term measures of core inflation over the most recent three and six months are now running below 3%. But uh, these shorter term measures are often volatile. And in any case, inflation is still too high and a few months of good data are only the beginning of what it will take to build confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward our goal. We cannot yet know how long these lower readings will persist or where inflation will settle over coming quarters. While the path is likely to be bumpy and to take some time, my colleagues and I are united in our commitment to bring down inflation sustainably to 2%. In the labor market, strong job creation has met a welcome increase in the supply of workers, due both to higher participation and to a rebound of immigration to pre-pandemic levels. Many indicators suggest that while conditions remain tight, the labor market is gradually cooling. Job openings have moved down well below their highs and are now only modestly above pre-pandemic levels. Quits are back to pre-pandemic levels as well, and the same is true of the wage premium earned by those who change jobs. Surveys of workers and employers show a return to pre-pandemic levels of tightness, and indicators of wage growth show a gradual decline toward levels that would be consistent with 2% inflation over time. To date, declining inflation has not come at the cost of meaningfully higher unemployment, a highly welcome development but also a historically unusual one. Healing of supply chains in conjunction with the rebalancing of demand and supply in the labor market has allowed disinflation without substantially weaker economic activity. Indeed, economic growth has consistently surprised to the upside this year, as most recently seen in the strong retail sales data released earlier this week. Forecasters generally expect GDP to come in very strong for the third quarter before cooling off in the fourth quarter and next year. Still, the record suggests that a sustainable return to our 2% inflation goal is likely to require a period of below trend growth and some further softening in labor market conditions. Geopolitical tensions are highly elevated and pose important risks to global economic activity. Of course, our institutional role at the Fed is to monitor these developments for their economic implications, which remain highly uncertain. But I will also say, speaking for myself personally, I found the attack on Israel horrifying, as is the prospect for more loss of innocent lives. Turning to monetary policy, the FOMC has tightened sub policy substantially over the past 18 months increasing the federal funds rate by 525 basis points at a historically fast pace and decreasing our securities holdings by roughly a trillion dollars. 
the stance of policy is restrictive, meaning that tight policy is putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation. Given the fast pace of the tightening, there may still be meaningful tightening in the pipeline. My colleagues and I are committed to achieving a stance of policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation sustainably down to 2% over time and to keeping policy restrictive until we're confident that inflation is on a path to that objective. We are attentive to recent data showing the resilience of economic growth and demand for labor. Additional evidence of persistently above trend growth or that tightness in the labor market is no longer easing could put further progress on inflation at risk and could warrant further tightening of policy. Along with many other factors, actual and expected changes in the stance of monetary policy affect broader financial conditions, which in turn affect economic activity, employment, and inflation. Financial conditions have tightened significantly in recent months, and longer-term bond deals have been an important driving factor in this tightening. We remain attentive to these developments because persistent changes in financial conditions can have implications for the path of monetary policy. My colleagues and I remain resolute in our commitment to returning inflation to 2% over time. A range of uncertainties, both old ones and new ones, complicate our task of balancing the risk of tightening monetary policy too much against the risk of tightening too little. Doing too little could allow above-target inflation to become entrenched and ultimately require monetary policy to wring more persistent inflation from the economy at a high cost to employment. Doing too much could also do unnecessary harm to the economy. Given the uncertainties and risks, and given how far we've come, the committee is proceeding carefully. We will make decisions about the extent of additional policy firming, and how long policy will remain restrictive based on the totality of the incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. Thank you. I look forward to our conversation, David. Thank you very much, Chair Powell, for being with us today for the remarks and for, for having a bit of a conversation here. We really appreciate it. It strikes me it's a particularly propitious time, given everything that's going on in the world and in the economy. There's a lot to talk about, a lot to discuss. Let me start with something you just referred to, which is the surprise to the upside in the economic data, despite, as you termed it, I think, historically fast pace of growth. Are you surprised at how resilient the United States economy is? Just today, we got jobless claims numbers, surprised because they were low. We got the retail sales numbers you mentioned. We've got industrial production. Across the board, it seems like a very strong economy, despite all you've done to try to slow it down. Yes, so uh, we certainly have a very uh, uh, resilient economy on our hands. We've got uh, the economy growing strongly. If you think back a year, many forecasts called for the U.S. Economy, economy to be in recession this year. Not only has that not happened, growth is now running for this year above its longer run trend. So that's been a surprise, driven largely by uh, consumer spending, driven by a very strong job market with uh, people getting jobs with high, first high nominal wages, and then as inflation has come down, real wages, which is spurring spending. And we've also had inflation coming down. So, you know, uh, that's, it, it really is a story of much stronger demand. There may also be, there may be some ways in which the economy is, um, less affected by interest rates. Uh, it's hard to know precisely, but for example, companies, many companies, any company with bond market access will have termed out its debt, right? And therefore may not be feeling the effects of higher rates. The same may be true of homeowners who have a, a long-term fixed rate, low rate mortgage, who then are therefore not, because it's not an adjustable rate or a higher rate, they're not, they're not feeling that increase in rates. So the, the economy may be somewhat less uh, susceptible to the effects of rate increases. On the other hand, if you look at um, look at interest-sensitive spending, these are very much the the, the, um, the places where we see we, where we expect to see and do see effects. So, for example, in um, in housing or in you know the housing sector has been sector has been very affected by higher rates as purchases of, of uh, durable goods. If you look at surveys, people will not say that it's a good time to buy a car or a house. Quite the contrary. So we see policy working through its usual channels. 
It may just be that rates haven't been high enough for long enough. And, and again, it's all happening in a context of, of very strong demand. We've heard other people speculate maybe the terming out of debt, as you say, both corporate debt and household debt, may diminish the effectiveness of rate hikes. Do you have a view on whether that's true? And if it is true, what does it say about monetary policy? Does it mean you have to go farther in the rate hikes, or do you just not have the power to affect it? So no, I, I, I don't think that, that there's a, um, a fundamental shift in the way that interest rates affect the economy. There may be some differences in this cycle because of what I mentioned. Um, I, as I mentioned, you, we are seeing those, the effects where we expect to see them, which is interest-sensitive spending and also asset prices to some extent. Uh, and the exchange rate, which you're also seeing a uh, strong exchange rate, which is, which is disinflationary. So I don't think there's a, a fundamental change in the way monetary policy affects the economy. And again, it goes back to just very strong demand. We take the economy as it is. We take fiscal policy and the economy and all the things we don't control, they come to us and we conduct policy always to achieve maximum employment and stable prices. So we just t take what comes. The fact that we have a strong growing economy, a strong growing labor market, and uh, you know in inflation coming down. These are the elements that we want to to see that to achieve the the outcome we want. It may take more time, but ultimately, uh, those are that's this is the kind of thing you would want to see along the path to getting through this without a big increase in unemployment. How much effect thus far has the Fed had? Uh, we, we all have memorized now long and variable lags. How long and how variable? And where are you in that process? Are you at the 25% point, the 50% in terms of seeing it in the effect in the real economy? So there's, there's no precision in, the, uh, in, in our understanding of, of how long lags are. Um, one thing that has changed in the modern era is that markets now uh, over the course of the last 30 years, central banks have decided instead of being secretive to be very transparent. And what that has meant is that markets move actually well in anticipation, well before our policy moves. So the transmission from policy moves to, to financial conditions actually happens before the moves now, whereas that was not the case 50 years ago when Milton Friedman you know, coined the phrase long and variable legs. So, but now you have financial conditions changing and the question is how does it affect the economy? The standard channels are uh, asset prices, interest sensitive spending and the exchange rate, for example. And we, again, we do see that happening just not as fast as we would like. And I would attribute some of that to just stronger demand. You know, household savings were, were turned out to be higher. Household spending has been stronger, and that's by far the largest part of the economy. In order to conduct monetary policy effectively, do you need at least a hypoth hypothesis about how much has already hit the economy? Because it's hard to know how much more you need to do if you don't know how far you've come. So on, on lags, I think if you think back, it's been a year since, now since, since the last 75 basis point hike we did. It was at the November meeting in 2022. The first one was in June, so it's more than a year. So we should be seeing the effects by the way, they don't all just arrive on one day. They, they arrive and then they're thought to peak and then to diminish. So there's a lot of uncertainty around lags. Um, and one of the reasons why we have slowed down significantly this year is to give monetary policy time to work. The truth is, though, you can find academic support for different, different speeds of, and, and duration of lags. So we have to use our eyes and a little bit of risk management and patience in slowing down the pace to make sure that we are seeing the full effects. And I think, again, that's, that's part of why we've slowed down this year. We've, you know, we, were, we went very quickly in 2022 to catch up to where we needed to be, and now we're moving carefully with these decisions. Uh, so when you spoke back in August of 2020 and sort of laid out the revisions to the framework, as it were, uh, you said that in terms of anticipated growth, the sort of consensus had gone from something like 2.5 to 1.8 percent, I think were the numbers you laid out in that. Where are you now? Where's the Fed? Where are you? And what you think basically the long-run growth is? Long-run potential growth um, is not something that moves around a lot over time, but I would, my, my own guess is it's around 2 percent. I think that the, the standard mainstream view would be a little bit below 2%, but I would just say 2% real growth uh, over time. 
And you know, what, what causes growth is you know, growth in hours worked plus growth in productivity. Growth in hours worked is, is a function of population growth in the long run and also labor force participation. Many things affect productivity. But if you, if you drop in reasonable, standard, longer term estimates of hours worked growth and productivity, which is just output per hour, productivity growth, you get something around 2%. And that's, that's higher than most other advanced economies. As you look at it, uh, do you see historical precedents for having a growing economy with high rates over a long period of time? I mean, as you look back, I mean, is it like the late 90s, for example? What, do you, what, what analogies do you draw as you try to determine what this might be doing to the economy over the longer term? So that, that's really a question about what the, what, the, what the level of rates will be going for, what the neutral level will be. And I think it's, it's very hard to know confidently what the answer to that will be in five years. Some of the reasons why rates were low for the last 25 years were just uh, the aging of the global population and globalization, and you know, so lots of savings and relatively, uh, with an aging population, savings greater than investment, so rates are lower, and productivity was low. So all of those led to low interest rates. So what has changed with the pandemic? You might see less effects from globalization. Certainly demographics, the, the aging of the global population has not changed. Um, I mean, this is a discussion we're having on an ongoing basis. It doesn't really affect current policy, but where will rates settle out? What will be a, a normal rate? So if, if, the, if a typical Fed tightening cycle would leave you at 5 or 6%, and, and this is, this is in the, before the pandemic and before this, the low inflation period, you would have had, had uh, Fed rates in 4 or 5% or even higher frequently. Are we going back to that? I really don't know. I wouldn't want to speculate. I mean, my guess is it'll be somewhere in the middle, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think we can say this now. Uh, the effect of lower bound is not an issue. You know, we were, we were very concerned about that. Right now, we're very far from the effect of lower bound, and the economy's handling it just fine. But that's, you know, that's because we're at a time of, of really elevated demand uh, coming out of the pandemic as we reopened with fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus. We have very strong demand in the United States. Hard to know what, what the economy will want in the way of interest rates when, when five years from now when all of the effects of the pandemic are behind us. You mentioned the long-term um, equilibrium rate, which you talked about again back in Jackson Hole in August of 2020. Back then you said you thought it had, the sort of consensus had come down. I think it was from like 4.25% to 2.5%. Where is it today? <laughs> um, so I think it, by any reckoning, long-term interest rates and the neutral inter interest rate came down steadily over the course of several decades. So where is it today? I, I, I don't know. Uh, it, you know, we're, we're finding it, uh, basically. Uh, the, the, the idea was, the, I think, the median indication of what the real neutral rate was around 50 basis points before the pandemic. <laughs> It may have risen in the near term. The real question that, that matters, though, is will it rise in the long term? And that we don't know. But do you need to know it in order to conduct monetary policy? I mean, you must have to have at least a theory. I mean, I'm not saying you have to be right about it, but you have to have a hypothesis, don't you? As you look at the data, you have to put the data through some sort of uh, a theory. So we, we, do, we all write down our estimates of the longer run neutral rate every quarter in the summary of economic projections. And, and that's based on models. It's based on also looking out the window and, and including lags, thinking how are our current rates affecting the economy. So the, the evidence of your eyes is that the economy is, is handling much higher rates, at least for now, without difficulty. So notionally, that, that might tell you that, that the neutral rate has risen, or it may just tell you that we haven't had rates high enough for long enough. Um, you're right, though, but I, you know, you, you, you have, we have models for everything. We have formulas for everything. Ultimately, as a practitioner, mm -hmm. we have to you know, be focused on what the economy is telling us, even taking lags into account. What's it telling us? Does, does it feel like policy is too tight right now? I would have to say no. I think the evidence is not that a policy is too tight right now. Um, so, and, and we're at five, five and a quarter to five and a half percent. Are, do you think we're entering into a new phase in monetary policy? We had the Volcker disinflation, I think you referred to it as, and then we had sort of inflation targeting for a time. Uh, there was concern about secular stagnation. We were pushing the zero bound, as you said. We were concerned about that. And then we had the pandemic, and we had the, the real problem with inflation. Uh, what's the next phase look like? What, 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 how would you describe it? What we've been through is in, all of the advanced economies around the world was a period where the effect of lower bound, the proximity of interest rates 
risk-free interest rates to the effective lower bound, which is zero or a little bit less, was a big problem for monetary policy. And, and just rates came down and down and down. And the problem is, if, if rates are gonna be close to zero in good times, then how do you cut? And so has, have central banks lost the power of their most important tool, which is interest rates? This was a subject of, of, a, of a vast literature in monetary policy research for 20 years. And, and you know the, the, the most common answer was some kind of a makeup strategy. So you would credibly promise to, to run inflation a little bit hot and above 2%, and that would anchor inflation at 2% to counter the times when it was below. So that was a very serious problem, which filled books worth of research. Then comes the pandemic, then comes the response to the pandemic, and then comes the pandemic inflation, not just in the United States, but everywhere. The question is, is that a secular change, or are these, these factors that brought us to that place, are they still out there waiting to come back? And you know, books are written on this subject now. You, you can argue that, uh, and some have argued that, that effectively the last 20 years before the pandemic were kind of a perfect storm of disinflation. Mm -hmm. And now that's all gone and we're going into a more inflationary period that will be characterized by more supply shocks and things like that and therefore more, more inflationary pressure. Yeah. So are we going into such a, I, I don't know. I mean, all, all I can tell you, I, I think it's unknowable and you know, great theorists and researchers have different views on this. It's not, it's not something you can settle in advance, we'll have to see. I think our, our issue is right now trying to achieve a sufficiently restrictive stance of, of policy, policy to bring inflation down to 2% over time. That's what we're really focused on. Whenever any of us go, particularly institutions, go through tumultuous times, and goodness knows you've been through a tumultuous time, uh, we look back and think, okay, what do we learn? Sort of an after action report. Look at the pandemic and the pandemic uh, inflation. What would you say you learned uh, in terms of macroeconomics, in terms of the economy, from that experience? So hindsight is, is always a wonderful yeah. thing, right? Um, I think the fair way to judge the actions that were taken is uh, to put yourself in, in, in the, the place of, uh, of legislators and, and policy, other, you know, and, and central bankers around the world. And there was, there was no playbook. You know, there, we've never seen, we hadn't seen a global economic shutdown. People were, th were thinking that the pandemic might kill a whole lot of people and that we wouldn't have a vaccine for five years. We might not have an economy for five years. So these things were all very possible in March of 2020. And so we pulled out all the stops and Congress put out all the stops. With the benefit of hindsight, could we have done a little bit less and had a little bit of inflation? I guess we could. But I think if you look overall at the performance of the US economy, our, our economy is the strongest. We, we're the, we have the, you know, the, we're, we're actually also making the most progress on inflation, but we certainly have the strongest growth. We're back to uh, prior growth trend. Um, you know, not just the level of where we were, we're actually back to the prior trend. Uh, the labor market, the last time we had uh, this many consecutive months of unemployment below 4% was in the late 1960s, so it's more than 50 years ago. So our economy is doing very well from all of that, but you know, if you had perfect hindsight, you might, have, you might not have had as much inflation if we'd done less. Although other countries who didn't do as much as we did also had substantial inflation problems. I think my question was just a little bit different. It's not so much of assigning blame or saying did somebody make a mistake as are there things that going forward would change the way you conduct monetary policy that you learned from that, that maybe nobody had reason to know at the time, but it was an experience you went through? Well, I, you know, we, we were in a time of a very long time, in a reasonably long time, of disinflationary forces. And I think everybody's instinct had been attuned to risks coming from this direction, which is too low inflation. And so what this has taught us is that the, you know, now, the, now that, that, period, that period is over, and we now have probably going forward a more balanced uh, set of risks where high inflation and low inflation are, are, are both risks. In fact, right now the risk is still high inflation, but I'm, I'm assuming once we get back to 2%, we won't have that, but I, we've certainly learned that. And uh, I mean, you, 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 things, events are, are the, the, the possible range of events is so much wider than what, he, what we think it is on any given day, right? The tails are so wide and it's just not human nature to constantly be thinking about things that are way out in the tail, but they happen in, in financial markets and in economies. They, they happen far more regularly than, than they should. 
I suspect every person in this room is well aware of what's going on with yields with bonds. Uh, it's been a big story, particularly in the longer end of the curve. What is your understanding of what is going on in the bond market and why those yields are going up, particularly, again, at the longer end of the curve? So it's really, uh, it's really two questions. One is, why is it happening? And, and the other is, why does it matter for policy? And so I would say on the why is it happening question, I think it's appropriate to have a little bit of humility. It's always hard to say exactly what's going on with longer term yields. But, but this is what I think we can say. First, what it's not. It's not apparently about expectations of higher inflation. And it's also not mainly about shorter term policy moves. So Fed funds moves over the next year or two. Really, if you, you can look at the two year, for example, and two years moved up a little bit since September, but really the move is in longer run bonds. So it's really happening in term premiums, which is the compensation for holding longer run securities, and not principally a function of the market looking at, at, at near term fund rate. I think other, uh, other, a few other ideas about, uh, there are many candidate ideas, and. Uh, and many people feeling their priors have been confirmed by this event, I'll say, as well. But um, so one would be just that uh, markets and analysts are seeing the resilience of the economy to high interest rates, and they're, they're revising their view about the, the overall strength of the economy and thinking even longer term, this may require higher rates. That could be part of it. Uh, you know, there may be a heightened focus on fiscal deficits. That could be part of it. QT could be part of it. Uh, another one you hear very often is the change, changing correlation between bonds and equities. If we're going forward into, if we are going forward into a world of more supply shocks rather than demand shocks, that could make bonds a, a less attractive hedge to equities, and therefore you need to be paid more to own bonds, and therefore the term premium goes up. So all, all of those uh, uh, are, are possible ideas. Then, then the question is, does it matter for us? As long as I'm talking about this, so. Um, the way I think about it is, uh, you know, we change our policy. Actual and expected changes in our policy affect uh, financial conditions. And persistent changes in financial conditions affect economic activity, hiring, and inflation. So one question is, are we seeing the longer run bonds, are they the increases in, in rates, are we seeing those come through in financial conditions in a persistent way? And I think if you look at financial conditions indexes, the answer so far would be yes, you are. Uh, persistence, it will be a matter of, of, of just seeing with our own eyes. But certainly, they're coming. if you look at financial conditions indexes, they're showing tightening, and it's a lot because of longer rates. Then the question is, is it endogenous, and is it just is it just because the market expects us to take things to, to, to take further actions to to, uh, to tighten monetary policy? In which case, if you have to follow through, but that doesn't seem to be the case. It, it, it doesn't seem to be principally about expectations of us doing more. It seems to, that the other factors are the more. Uh, the more prominent ones. Another question is... Uh, bottom, bottom line, though, that, that means it probably does over time. It makes sense. It's something that we'll be looking at. Well, that, that's the question I was asking, is over time. It, 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 from what you understand right now, do you think this is a temporary phenomenon, or do you think there are structural factors, whatever they are, and we can talk about what they might be, that would really... Are, uh, this is the future that we're looking at now. Well, so of, of the factors I just listed, some of them are shorter term, some of them are longer term, and some of them could be either. So, for example, fiscal, concerns over fiscal deficits, uh, that, that could be a longer-term factor. The, the, the change in, in correlations between stocks and bonds could be a long-term. I, I don't think we know. I think, um, you know, basically, bond prices are set by supply and demand. The supply of, of treasuries is, is, a, is a known thing, but demand can be affected by any and all of these theories, and also just by sentiment, sentiment too, which is hard to characterize. So, you know, markets have been volatile. They've been uh, longer, you, you know, you've seen the uh, rates moving up and down a lot. I think we have to let this play out and watch it. Uh, but we, you know, for now, it, it looks, it's, it's clearly a tightening in financial conditions, and so we'll be watching it carefully. Talking about the fiscal side, and you've been very careful repeatedly to say you want to stay in your lane, you're not responsible for fiscal issues. At the same time, you have to take into account, and it looks like the United States is going to have to borrow a fair amount of money. By the way, other countries are as well around the world. We have a, a big, a big supply of treasuries coming on board. Uh, to what extent do you think that is a longer-term issue? And let me tie it back to 
to something you referred to in your remarks, actually. When we see geopolitical conflict around the world, like in Israel, like in Ukraine, some of the buildup with respect to China, the defense spending is going to be elevated for the United States and for other countries. Do you take that into account in figuring monetary policy? Because it may well mean that we're borrowing a lot more money than we have in the past. So we, of course, see the same, same things that everyone else. I just came back from IMF meetings this weekend, and there's a lot of talk of the very large resource demands that organizations like the IMF and, and of course, countries are facing, and the need for substantial amounts of revenue. You mentioned military. There's also dealing with, with climate change and things like that. So it's a, there, there's a lot of that. Um, we don't, as you mentioned, we don't comment on, on uh, fiscal policy. Actually, the fiscal authorities have oversight over us and, and not the other way around, so we, we stay away from that. Um, so I, I, I would just say everyone knows that it's not a secret, and about all I can say is we know that we're on an unsustainable path fiscally. It's not that the level of the debt is unsustainable. It's not. It's that where the path we're on is unsustainable, and we'll have to get off that path sooner rather than later. It's not really something, though, that affects a, a monetary policy decision about whether how much we raise rates in the next six months. It's not, it's not going to be driven by, um, uh, it, I mean, if there were some vast new fiscal policy that were about to be enacted, then that, that would have an effect on the models and would have an effect on projections and indirectly that would affect us. But we would not be in a position of responding directly to fiscal policy. When we talk about the treasury market, obviously there's, there's buying and selling. Uh, and the United States government is issuing a lot of treasuries. There's also a question of who's buying. And we're, we now have one buyer who stepped out of the marketplace, namely the Fed, which is a big buyer. Uh, at the same time, we're getting reports that maybe some of the overseas buyers uh, may be pulling back as well. How do you take that into account in, in, in assessing where we're going with long-term bond yields? So actually, um, uh, I think buying by overseas uh, entities has actually been pretty robust this year. So there have been some small changes, but I think by and large, it's been it's, they've, they've been buying uh, you know robustly. Again, we look at we look at the broad financial conditions. We look at interest rates, other asset prices. That's what we look at. We're not we, we're not um, you know we don't focus on fiscal policy. We wouldn't change monetary policy. Because, because of, uh, for example, it, uh, you know, because we think that the U.S. is on an unsustainable path. Everyone knows that. Uh, we're just going to do monetary policy to achieve maximum employment and stable prices. Uh, and that's how we think about it. I'm curious, though. Um, one of the things you're most concerned about is the real economy, what's going on in the real economy. You distinguish yourself from some of your predecessors in that you have a significant exposure to the private sector, not just the public sector, academics. As you talk to CEOs, people in business, uh, what are you hearing about the cost of capital? Because these bond prices are really affecting cost of capital uh, for the first time in a while. There was a long time the cost of capital felt like it was almost zero. And business changes an awful lot when you really, when the price of money goes up. I talked to several people this week who run companies, and they each said that the economy remains strong and that they don't see the consumer you know, you see, it, it, there, there's some areas where, where where spending is softening, but overall, I mean, look at the retail sales number. The yeah. consumer is strong, um, uh, volume is not going up very much, but but uh, companies are profitable. You don't, you know, now if you get to where I think the cost of capital would really matter would be for smaller companies and and early stage companies, and that really does matter. So we, you know, we don't have a lot of tools. We have interest rates, and they're far from perfect. Perfect. It's famously a blunt tool, mm -hmm. but it's what we have to get uh, uh, inflation down. And, and really, the world counts on us to deliver uh, low and stable inflation. That's what we have to do. And you know, at a time like this, there are, you know, we know that we're having negative effects on. You know, we had the home builders in this week. It's a very tough time in the whole home building industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that, uh, but ultimately, what we want to get back to is a long period of price stability. That's the best thing we can provide, and that, that pro policymakers and businesses and everyone can and people can can just lead their lives not worrying about inflation. This is what we can deliver. It's what we have to deliver, and this is the time. You know, our independence is is not for times when we're really popular. It's for when we're now when we're doing something that 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 really the public counts on us to do notwithstanding that it's, that it's challenging and difficult. And, and, you know, higher interest rates are difficult for everybody. 
You have not wavered from your commitment to 2%. You did it again today, 2%. No question about it. There are those who suggested, including some colleagues in the Fed, that maybe the bond market is doing part of your job for you. Is that the way you see it? I, look, I would, I would say it this way. Um, the whole idea of, of uh, tightening policy is to affect financial conditions. And to the extent higher bond rates reflect, they, they do. They're producing tighter financial conditions right now. So that is, that's how monetary policy works. That's literally how it works. So again, in principle, as long as, they're, as, long as uh, bond rates are going up for, the, for some reasons, and they're not going up just because they expect us to do things, so that if we don't do them, they'll come right back down. As long as, and we don't think that's the case, actually. It doesn't, I don't think it's the case. It's, it doesn't seem to me that's, that's what, where analysis leads you. Then sure, that's a tightening. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve. And therefore, it seems like almost arithmetic, it must reduce some of the impetus for you to continue to raise rates. At the margin, it could. I mean, I think that remains to be seen. And by the way, I'm not blessing any particular level of longer term rates, but just in principle, that's right. Uh, so let's talk about the labor market. Uh, you referred to that in your remarks as well. Uh, and as you say, vacancies have come down some, although they still are pretty elevated, if I'm not mistaken. Quits have actually gone up some. It seems to be a tight labor market. What do you make of what's going on in the labor market right now? Labor market has been extraordinarily strong. So what happened in the pandemic was we had a negative labor supply shock, is one way to think about it. So a whole lot of people left the labor market when the pandemic happened and then didn't come back. And so when the economy reopened and everybody, you know, there was, remember, there was revenge travel and revenge everything, uh, very strong demand, and, and there just weren't the people. So you had two job openings for every person actively seeking employment. We've never been anywhere near close to that. There was panic, you, that, you know, and wages and bonuses, and particularly in things like uh, in-person services where people had not gotten big wage increases and didn't want to come back to work. So that's, that's where we were. So since then, there are very many signs that the labor market is getting back into balance. And I talked about some of that in my remarks. Uh, surveys of work, you know, we survey businesses. We don't do it, but other people survey businesses and say, are workers plentiful? And that measure, that measure was no, but now it's back to pre-pandemic levels. You survey workers, are jobs plentiful? And that was at an all-time high, and now it's still high, but back. So wages are, wage increases are coming back down to more normal levels. Job openings are down from 2 to 1.4. They were at 1.2 in the, in the very tight labor market of 2019. By, so, by you know, the, the work week, by so many measures, the labor market is gradually cooling. And part of that is this, all through 2022, we thought we were going to get more labor supply, and we didn't. And I personally thought, well, I guess we won't get any. And then we've gotten a substantial amount this year. The, uh, the labor, female labor force participation is at an, in, in prime age workers is at an all-time high, which has to be related in, in some way to uh, work from home. But labor force participation increased, immigration increased, and now you, you see that in, in the overall cooling of the labor market. So even though job creation is still very high, there are the workers to fill those jobs. And again, businesses will tell you it's, that it's very different. It's still a very tight labor market, but it's, it's loosening. Coming back to your goal of 2% inflation, what have you learned from this experience about the relationship between inflation and labor? I mean, there's a lot of talk about a Phillips curve, whether it still applies, whether it's weaker, what is it? What, what's your hypothesis right now with the relationship between inflation and labor market? Well, let me tell you what, what it was before. So um, one of my favorite charts is just the slope of the Phillips curve over 40 years. And so it shows the relationship between unemployment and inflation. If you go back to the high inflation of the 70s, it was a very tight relationship. And that relationship just went down and down and down to the effect where the Phillips curve, there was almost no relationship, meaning uh, the, the, the Phillips curve was very, very flat. Um, now, actually, if you just ignore cause and just look at the data, it will tell you that, that the relationship is back. Do we really think that's a sustainable thing? I don't know. What, what happened, though, was that people, people came to seriously expect 2% inflation, something like 2% inflation. And if people expect that, if companies expect it and workers expect it and you expect that in your shopping, then that's what will happen in, in a way. And that's what, that's what happened. So even in very, very tight labor markets, we didn't have high inflation. I was at the Fed since 2012. As unemployment went from six to five to four into the threes for the first time, 
And you know, the models were all saying that we should be seeing some inflation, and we never saw, we never really saw 2% inflation on a sustained basis during that era. So we learned that the Phillips curve was really flat. Some pronounced it dead. Um, now, uh, I, I don't think most of the inflation we're seeing at all is from, is from the Phillips curve, though. I think it was built really the collision of very strong demand, really strong demand, with, with constrained supply. Cars being a great example. Many people wanted cars, didn't want to ride public transportation, wanted to move to the suburbs. Unlimited demand for cars, interest rates are low. Yet we couldn't get semiconductors, so there are no more cars. Car production went down. How do you solve that problem? Prices just go way, way up for cars. That's how you clear the market. So that's, that's a classic example of what happened here. It really wasn't about the Phillips curve. It was more about constrained supply and demand more broadly, especially for goods at the beginning. Let's turn to another responsibility of yours, which is the banking system. Last March, we had something with scare because of, I guess, interest rate risk with Silicon Valley Bank and then some others. Uh, are, are we through that now? Where are we in that process? Are you, are you resting easy? So what you pay us for is not to rest easy. Um, we, uh, we, we don't do that. Uh, so, but I would say where we are is this, though. Things have certainly settled down, certainly have settled down. Um, we see the funding markets is fine. We see, and, and you know, we, we, we paid a lot of attention to banks that, that looked anything like the banks that had the problems and made sure that they, that they had credible liquidity plans and plenty of liquidity and, and all of that. And so I think all of that has worked. And we, we set up this facility that's available to, for banks to borrow. And so all of that has led to a real settling down. But you know, our job is to be on the case. And you know, we're still on the case. And uh, we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep after that. Um, banks are generally very well capitalized and highly liquid in our country. Banks are strong. You know, we benefit from all those years of reform under Dodd-Frank and, and Basel III that we went through, uh, you know, with former Governor Tarullo right. uh, and, uh, and many others. Yeah. And so we benefit from a very strong, well-capitalized uh, banking system that's much better at managing its risks than the one that entered the global financial crisis. Very well-capitalized, but you want some more. This is about that, and that's affecting downtown real estate in a lot of big cities and um, uh, higher rates as well, as you point out. So this is, this is an issue that we pay a great deal of very careful attention to. Uh, commercial real estate is not a, is not a principal risk or, or a, a major risk for the very large, largest banks. Right. It is much more for uh, regional and, and really, the, really the smaller banks have, have proportionally a much larger exposure to real estate, so commercial real estate. So what we've done is the supervisors are in there looking at re real estate portfolios. They're working with banks to make sure that they have, they have plans to deal with the problems they have in their portfolio. These, uh, these problems evolve over time. They don't, they don't land with great suddenness like a market event. And so we're working with all of the bank regulators are working with uh, banks that have you know, concentrations of troubled real estate to work it out. Um, there will be losses for sure. Uh, you can drive down through most downtowns, in many downtowns anyway, and see uh, buildings that are empty and things like that. But we're, work we're working through it, uh, and you know we're, we're on that case, and, and don't see it as uh, you know as presenting much broader problems. But our job is to make sure that it doesn't. As you mentioned, regional banks are where a lot of people focus on this. As you conceptualize the banking system, <clears throat> what is the role of the regional banks? We have the super big banks that don't look like they're going anywhere. And we've got the community banks, the smaller banks, that we understand are critical, for, particularly for small businesses and local context. But what about the regional banks? How much pressure is there on them? And what would the, would the damage be to the system if, in fact, there was more consolidation with some of the big banks? I think the regional banks are very important, extremely important. You know, we, are, we have 4,500 banks, which is a lot more than any other country per capita or per dollar of GDP. But we have, you know, our, our GSIBs, the largest banks, are the leading banks in the world in profitability and in their success in their business. We have community banks in, in, in you know, who deal in, in smaller communities. But we also have these great regionals, and I think they do they do a, a great business among with, you know with with many companies. And uh, I I do think their business model is under pressure, and I would not like to see us add to that by treating them exactly like like GSIBs. I think they need they don't need exactly the same attention that a GSIB gets. So, but I, I would say we, we I personally think, and I think we at the Fed strongly think that that the 
that the regionals and the smaller regionals are, are an enormously important part of our banking system. Okay, you've been very generous with your time. Really appreciate it. I have one last question. Are you having a good time? And, <laughs> you and if now, so, why? Now or? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I assume this wasn't that pleasant, but in general, are you enjoying your job? <laughs> I would say this. First of all, it's, it's an incredible honor to do this job. And every day I do it, I feel so fortunate and so lucky and blessed to be entrusted with this. And uh, you know, all I want to do is do the best job I can for the public that we all serve. Uh, and yes, there's, there's a lot that, that's enjoyable about it. But mostly, it's just uh, so important to get it right. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you so much, Chair Thank Powell. You. Really good to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, All right, absolutely fantastic interview at the Economic Club in New York. That was our own David Weston. He anchors, of course, Wall Street Week, sitting down with Jay Powell for, um, I'm going to say, 35, 36 minutes there. Uh, he got a lot out of him. Um, one of the main headlines, I think, was that he says rates are doing some of their job for them. He says at the margin, yields, yields could mean less need to hike. And that's something we've heard from other um, Federal Reserve uh, governors, but it's important to hear it from Jerome Powell, especially so close to the blackout period. You know, we're only going to hear from Fed speakers now tomorrow and Saturday before they're done talking until the next meeting in November. He also said that the evidence is that policy is not too tight right now. And he made um, some remarks earlier indicating that they could still raise rates again. So uh, we have seen markets whipsawed in this environment. You've seen uh, the S&P go from gains to losses to gains again. And the same is true, of course, when you look at the bond markets. Take a look here at the numbers, S&P 500 right now, up a third of 1%. And this is not on low volume. You know, we were already 20% above the kind of volume we've typically seen over on the average over the last 30 days on the S&P. So usually, you know, when you have a Fed meeting, for example, you'll see very light volume. But it's been pretty heavy today in stocks, certainly on the S&P 500. You have the 10-year yield coming up to 495.13 right now, and it's been right up under 5%. Hasn't hit the 5% level since 2007. We're currently at the highest level that we've been since July of that year on the 10-year yield, and it looks pretty much the same across the curve. Here you see the 30-year yield above 5% at 5 spot 0.629%. So this is what uh, Jerome Powell means when he says um, that, you've got, that you've got to let uh, what's going on in the rates market play out. They're watching it closely and that yields are doing a little bit of their job um, in terms of uh, holding back the economy to some extent. Let's get over to Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Editor Mike McKee. He joins us now from Washington, D.C. Mike, you watched uh, the speech and the interview as well. What do you take from Jerome Powell's comments? Well, I think he basically aligned himself with the rest of the Open Market Committee and leaves the impression that the Fed is definitely going to be on hold on November 1st. I don't know how far you can take that out from there, but it didn't sound like he's in any hurry to raise interest rates. Now, uh, he did move the markets a lot, particularly at the long end. I've been watching the yield curve during his speech, and it significantly widened out, then came back in a little bit. Uh, he originally said that he didn't think rates were uh, too tight, and so the market took that as, oh, we might see him raise rates more. And then he came back and said later, as you noted, that at the margin, the yield rise could mean that the Fed has to do less, uh, which is what we've heard from a lot of other Fed officials. So in terms of uh, monetary policy, it does look like uh, the Fed is kind of where the market thinks they would be. And we see that reflected in futures, Matt. Uh, the uh, futures uh, guess for the November 1st meeting is down to a 3% chance of the Fed raising rates. It, it wasn't significantly higher, but it has dropped since uh, Powell began speaking. And not a lot of change in the, November, uh, in the December uh, Fed funds futures. And I guess we'll watch the data for that as the Fed will. You know, when we look at the rise in yields, um, you, obviously the Fed plays a huge part in it, but you've got to wonder how much a part in it uh, the fiscal spending plays and debts and deficits. We recently heard Steve Major come out and say that he was wrong in thinking that doesn't mean anything. And now Powell has told David Weston um, that 
it, it, it is important uh, and that he realizes we're not on a sustainable path. He said the focus on deficits as well as quantitative tightening could be part of the yield rise. Are the bond vigilantes finally coming back, Mike? Uh, well, uh, it, to the extent there were such things, then you could make the argument that they are. And there certainly is a question, not about the long-term sustainability, but about the fact that the government has to sell a lot of paper uh, within the next six months or so, and the Fed is no longer buying. As a matter of fact, the Fed is letting some of its holdings roll off in QT, and therefore that creates more demand uh, for other buyers. And the question is, do they step up and buy and at what price, which is going to make things interesting going forward. Now, the Fed never takes a position on the fiscal policy of the U.S. other than to say we're on an unsustainable path. He doesn't offer any solutions. But it is true that uh, with all of this additional debt that the U.S. has to sell, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens to rates, particularly longer rates, when we get to the next refunding at the end of the month and the Treasury announces how much it has to borrow in December. Will that say and rates much higher, does that create distortions in the Treasury market that the Fed may or may not have to address? And then how does it affect monetary policy? If rates go up even more, does that slow the economy too much? Uh, does it uh, give the Fed less to do? Uh, it is a very, on the fiscal side, very unsettled situation for the Fed. All right, Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Editor Michael McKee talking to us about Jerome Powell's uh, interview there um, with David Weston. Let's get over to Kathy Jones right now, Chief Fixed Income Strategist at Charles Schwab. And Kathy, as Mike pointed out, um, you know, during that speech, we saw real moves in rates, especially at the long end. What do you make of the climbing curve? Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting. The initial reaction was a short end sold off. You see our yields came down at the short end, and we kind of reversed that, and then we started to see the curve re-steep. And I don't know that there was anything <clears throat> particularly fresh in what uh, Paul's had to say. <clears throat> and that may be what's reflected in the continued uh, bear steepening of the curve. So what you're seeing is a focus on how long the Fed has to stay on hold to slow the economy and cool off the labor market even more. And that's that's what I took away. Those are the two big criteria for um, the Fed. Yep. We want to see the economy slow to a more sustainable level, meaning 2 percent or less, and um, to see the unemployment rate go up and or wage growth slow down. And we're not there yet. So it leaves the door open to another rate hike, I don't think, at the November meeting, but leaves the door open to another rate hike. And that has the market concerned. As Mike was, uh, as Mike McKee was just saying, it really seemed like Jerome Powell was getting on the same page as the rest of the Fed speakers that we've had uh, of late, and we've had a ton. I think we have seven, including Powell, seven Fed speakers today. There are more to come tomorrow and Saturday. But are they uh, telegraphing exactly what they're going to do before each meet? Do we know that they're not going to raise rates now in November, and that they think the the, the rising uh, rates in Treasuries are doing their job for them? Well, I, I would say it's pretty um, pretty apparent, right? Uh, the Fed does like to signal ahead of time if they're going to make a change in policy. I think that we would have heard that from the variety of Fed speakers that we've heard. And actually, we've heard just the opposite, that they're content with the way things are playing out. They're content to wait and see and be patient and see if there's a need for another tightening move or not. So uh, at this stage of the game, I put a very, very low probability on a rate hike in November. So the interesting thing, Kathy, is that it looks like the economy is speeding along here. I mean, it's running hot. If you look at the Atlanta now GDP forecast, 5.4%. In Q3, I'm already hearing people talk about uh, almost 5% growth in this current quarter um, on Wall Street. And you've got retail spending that is strong. You've got uh, claims that are low, the lowest since January today, and we're already in October. Um, how do they see what they're doing uh, uh, working if the economy is still running so hot and we're still seeing you know, headline inflation at least way too high? 
Yeah, I think, um, as, as Paul noted, the economy has been far more resilient than I think most models would have uh, as expected it to be. Uh, including the Fed's models. Uh, but keep in mind, before the last couple of quarters, last quarter and a half, um, growth was sub, uh, sub-trend, sub-2% for quite some time. And I, I think what we're looking at is this, you know, uncertainty around long and variable lags, right? So we don't really know how much the recent tightening is going to affect growth in the next couple of quarters. And I, I think that's what the Fed is focused on. They know there's a lot of tightening in the, in the pipeline. They know that credit lending standards have tightened up quite a bit, and that's affecting housing, that's affecting auto sales, that's affecting various parts of the market, particularly for consumers who are very reliant on financing and for mm. smaller businesses really reliant on that near-term financing. So big companies may have termed out their debt, but small companies tend to finance and refinance on a regular basis. So yep. you're seeing those companies start to struggle a bit. Yep. So I think it's this question of, you know, do we have a couple of quarters of above trend growth and then revert back to that lower trend that we saw you know, late last year and in the beginning of this year. So watching uh, how small and medium-sized companies react to higher uh, yields, watching how consumers react to these higher rates. Pal actually um, said something about that in his interview with David Weston just now. Let's listen to what he had to say. Markets have been volatile. They've been uh, longer, you know, you've seen the uh, rates moving up and down a lot. I think we have to let this play out and watch it. Uh, but we, you know, for now, it, it looks, it's, it's clearly a tightening in financial conditions, and so we'll be watching it carefully. So do you see it actually working in terms of tightening financial conditions? Because, well, clearly it's definitely worked in the housing market, right? But we still see prices, for example, on automobiles soaring. Yeah, I think there's some supply demand dynamic there on the in the auto sector uh, that's keeping those prices high. But we're also seeing delinquency on auto loans go sky high and repossessions start to go up. We're seeing uh, charge offs on credit cards go up. We're seeing personal bankruptcy filings going up. So on the one hand, you know, you kind of have this dynamic where there's some spending going on. On the other hand, you can see where there's stress, uh, where that spending has been. So I think it's very unsettled, but it does look like the tightening that we've seen so far is having an impact. It tends to start sort of at the bottom, at least credit worthy borrowers, whether that be small businesses or um, individuals at the lower income and wealth uh, spectrum. And then it works its way through where you get that more cautious approach, uh, even amongst folks that have have good jobs, you know, have a certain amount of wealth, they start to get more cautious as things slow down. So I think it's a, a waiting game, a time game, and that's why the Fed's leaving the door open, because they're saying, you know, we kind of see that this is in the pipeline. If you read the comments from the regional uh, districts, um, you're hearing, you're seeing a lot of commentary there from small businesses that inflation's not their big concern anymore, but it's new orders, it's commercial real estate, right. uh, it's the unsettled conditions out there. So I think they're willing to give it some time, but yeah. not too much time, well, no. because if things are to re-accelerate, they're going to have to tie it does look like an important juncture for sure. Great to get your insight around this. Kathy, thanks so much for joining us. Kathy Jones, their chief fixed income strategist over at Charles Schwab. Coming up, former Fed governor and chair of Wells Fargo, Betsy Duke, joins us to talk about uh, Powell, the economy, and rates. This is Bloomberg. That's me, Max. What's up? How are you? 
I have been writing about Wall Street for almost 15 years. And what that means is I write about feuds and rage and rises and falls and comebacks. And every now and then, I also write about a couple of villains. Thank you so much. And now, I am about to do something new and very, very scary. We are making a show. And it's based on Bloomberg Business Week magazine. So what is this show about? It's a show about money, power, culture, pop business. We're gonna ask complicated and profound people about their ideas, their careers, their lives, their risks, their failures, their imagination. It's so incredibly liberating not to care what other people think. I was giving my tools to other communities. I wanted to bring those tools home. Tune in. Like, please, like, really actually tune in. I, I desperately need an audience. On the next episode of the Business Week Show, risk. The way that I look at risk in that sense, it's not that I'm attracted to these thrill seeks. It's, I think this is worth it. I love that you're accusing investment bankers writ large of a certain kind of interpersonal shallowness. You're not gonna put words in my mouth, well, are you? Well, I'm, I'm the interviewer now. <laughs> Watch the Business Week Show, Thursday nights, 10.30 Eastern on Bloomberg Television or 8.30 on Bloomberg.com or the Bloomberg app on connected TVs. We have models for everything, we have formulas for everything. Ultimately, as a practitioner, mm -hmm. we have to you know, be focused on what the economy is telling us, even taking lags into account. What's it telling us? Does, does it feel like policy is too tight right now? I would have to say no. I think the evidence is not that a policy is too tight right now. Um, so, and, and we're at five, five and a quarter to five and a half percent. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Matt Miller. That was Fed Chair Jay Powell speaking in the last hour with our own David Weston. Betsy Duke is a former Federal Reserve governor and former chair of Wells Fargo. She joins us now to, um, to help us assess what we heard from uh, Governor Powell as well as what we're watching in markets um, these days, Betsy. And it's incredibly fascinating to see this, this economy um, continue to, to power along, as we've been talking about for the past couple days, Atlanta now GDP forecast uh, pointing to 5.4% of growth in Q3. And we're hearing from some banks on Wall Street they expect to uh, keep that level of growth in the current quarter, almost 5%. So um, what do you make of this power in the economy in the face of, you know, 5.5% Fed funds rates? So I think it's easy to get distracted by the nominal Fed funds rate. So where Fed funds are today um, and, and to look at how far rates have come, how quickly they've come up. But if you look at it in terms of real rates, if you look at the real interest rates, so you take the nominal Fed funds rate and you subtract out inflation, actually policy has been restrictive up until this summer. It wasn't until sometime in July or August that the Fed funds rate actually got higher than inflation rates. So, um, and, and then if you look historically, the real Fed funds rate has been, has been quite a bit higher. In fact, for most of my banking career, a Fed funds rate of 5% would have been considered neutral or normal. So I think the committee is really feeling its way to what is the right level of real interest rates, not so much nominal interest rates. And, and that has to do with both where the, the rates are as well as what the underlying inflation is. So what's your take? I mean, this has been a debate, you know, what is our star? What is the um, natural rate above which policy is restrictive and below which it's stimulative? Um, and some people are willing to say, I think it's moved higher than it has been in the past. But I don't think a lot of people are willing to go out and say uh, where they really think that is. Is it two and a half percent? Is it three percent? We're still quite far off when you look at real rates. Well, again, if, if you go back to when the first model came out and, and when it was calculated, the neutral Fed funds rate, I think, was around expected to be around 4 percent, 4.5. So it was certainly higher than, than it's believed to be today. When I was at the Fed, the general belief was that uh, our star, the neutral rate, was at about a half a percent. So if you looked at 2 percent inflation and half a percent for a neutral rate, 2.5 percent would be what would be considered 
neutral. And I think when the first stock plots came out, that's where everybody was, was two and a half. Now I see them going up a bit. And you see five or six of the dots now up a little bit higher than, than the two and a half. Some of them going up into four. So um, I think it is higher. And I, the reason I think so probably has to do with a change in globalization. It seemed to come down when you had a more global economy, um, when you had more global financial markets. Now, with political isolationism, as well as the the um, the breakages in supply chains, particularly international supply chains, experienced during the pandemic, I think you're going to have less globalization. And in my mind, that is going to push the neutral level of Fed funds rate up a bit. So this, I mean, would seem to imply, Betsy, that the Fed needs to raise rates even more to slow the economy and to get inflation down to 2%. I mean, they used to want to average 2%, right? But in order to right. do that, uh, they need to bring it below that level and then hold it for like 40 years. So I don't know uh, what the ultimate goal is now, but it doesn't seem like they want to raise rates with you know, mortgages at 8%, do they? Well, they don't necessarily have to raise rates in order to tighten policy. Because remember, it's the difference between the inflation rate and the policy rate. So if inflation continues to tick down a tenth or, or two tenths a month, then that is actually raising the real rate, tightening policy. And so you begin at that point to be able to see where, where restrictive ends up being. If inflation ticks back up and, and experienced inflation from the standpoint of the consumer is a core inflation, it's, it's headline. And so if with what's going on in, in terms of the Middle East, if, um, if gas prices start to rise, then that's going to impact the consumer and, and that actually changes the level of real rates in the wrong direction. So how... Uh, how hard is it going to be for the Fed to bring inflation down to its target when we have, you know, an Inflation Reduction Act that spends an additional trillion dollars, when we're running um, annual deficits of one and a half trillion plus, and it doesn't look like that's going to slow, rather accelerate? I mean, they're actually operating at cross purposes with the federal government. Well, definitely the, the debt level is unsustainable. And at some point, that is going to be affecting particularly longer term rates even more than what the Fed is doing. So, you know, that, that I think is an entirely separate issue. With respect to the Fed's policy rate and short term, short term rates, what I think is going to happen is if you see inflation sort of stagnate, stay at current levels, then the committee will conclude that they have to raise rates a bit. If you see inflation continue to drift down a bit, they may feel they'll feel more comfortable. And if inflation starts to really drop, then um, they may follow that with drops in in the nominal rate or in, in the policy rate. So I think that's the, the the key piece to keep an eye on right now. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the banking landscape. Uh, Betsy, given your um, position previously uh, at Wells Fargo, what do you think about this time right now for, for the big banks, even for the regional banks, in terms of um, net interest income and kind of beefing up their, their balance sheets? So on, on a steady state basis, actually a 5% Fed funds rate gives banks a lot more room to maneuver on the net interest margin, a lot more room for differences in, in different business models. So I don't think that's a bad rate for the banking business. Having gotten there as quickly as we did, and you know some banks definitely have loan, I mean, um, investment portfolios that are underwater. But as far as a, a, an interest rate environment in which to operate, I don't think this is bad for the banks. All right, Betsy, great to get some time with you. Really appreciate your insight. Betsy Duke, former Federal Reserve governor and former chair of Wells Fargo, talking to us about the Fed rates and the economy. Let's turn now to a big part of that economy, the housing sector. Sales of previously owned U.S. homes fell in September to the lowest level since 2010. For that, we bring in Bloomberg's Augusta Sariva. Augusta, thanks so much um, for joining us. This is... a uh, a fascinating area of discussion because of the rise in rates. We've seen kind of the housing market grind to a halt. Um, Claudia Sahn this morning on surveillance was saying, hey, it's, it's tough for people now, but keep in mind how easy it was over the last decade, right? Everyone's refinanced down to two or three percent. Um, but but what, what is it going to take to break this new log jam with mortgage rates at eight percent? Nobody wants to sell a house. 
Yeah, exactly. Like you said, it's been a pretty tough year for the housing market, but especially for the resale market, because what we're seeing with mortgage rates rising, I mean, they rose for pretty much every single week for almost two months now. And what that does to the resale market is that it has the sort of double-edged impact, right? At the same time that they do take a toll on affordability, buyers are thinking twice about taking on a mortgage rate at almost 8%. You also have sellers that are thinking twice about going into the market and selling their house, right? So that's also taking a toll on inventory levels. So what does this mean for the housing market? Does it just, just mean, uh, you know, builders are out there in full force putting up as much inventory as they can? Builders are trying, and I mean, at the start of the year, we saw that they were having a very good year so far. They uh, were seeing sales go up as people were fleeing the resale market. They were seeing some of the supply chain issues that took a toll uh, on a, a con new construction for the past two years. They were pretty much gone by the start of the year, but now what they're seeing is that mortgage rates are too high even for the new construction market. So they are out there offering incentives. They are offering financial incentives, mortgage one but it's not enough. And that's one of the reasons why we saw home builder sentiment fall to a nine month low uh, this month. So uh, it, rates are tough then for everybody in terms of sales of previously owned homes, in terms of home builders as well. Does this mean that, you know, a whole generation uh, of uh, new family families forming aren't going to be able to buy into the real estate market? Possibly. One of the things that we saw in uh, NAR's report this morning was exactly that, that the share of first-time home buyers was actually at a historically low, and it has been falling month after, after month for a while. So if it, this is your first chance to go out there and you're seeing mortgage rates at almost 8% still going up, you might think twice about that, right? So uh, we saw that for first-time home buyers. And at the same time, another share that we saw hit a 10-year high was actually uh, cash sales, right? So those who get to avoid uh, mortgage rates, which right now are mostly either people who are buying a second house who already uh, have been in this market before or investors are the ones who are having the most lucky right now, the most right. luck right now. All right, Augusta, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Bloomberg's Augusta Sariva there talking to us about the housing market. Coming up, our market coverage continues as Powell's remarks move rates. This is Bloomberg. With sensors. There's uh, several cameras that look out at your world because we're mapping your physical world so we can put the content in there. There's several cameras looking at your eyes so we know where you're looking in your physical world. And that's a lot of data. That's a lot of very personal data. Um, there's there's a, a number of other sensors on the device that are needed to make it work in the way it does. So we feel strongly that, uh, first of all, people should know what these devices can do. And, um, and since we're at the beginning of the curve, let's work on the right guidelines and put those guardrails in place now versus